Aloha kako. <clears throat> Thank you so much for coming to my talk. This is the 100 generations of Hawaiian ancestors leading us into the future. It's the first time I've done this, so you're getting something. Brand new off of the, um, off of, um, uh, <laughs> so, what am I talking about? I want to look at how our ancestors but I need to come out and I need to ask permission to ask them. So I need to do it Z, can you make it go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this is a book that I've written for Kule and Rogue Kale and Sango. And I like to call it Entertainment. So, See, as you follow the long change of screen, you see I have it in English as well as in English, so you get to see that uh, go back to the first or last one, please. Audio is not clear. What can we do about that? Z, can you go back to the first slide? And then, well, how do we fix my button? Sorry, sorry, Kuma, your audio is kind of going in and out. Um. Okay, so the audio is distorted uh, according to the chat. Some Somebody can't hear anything at all. Shall I just call into you and have it run through my phone? Oh, no, you're, <clears throat> you're, you're very clear right now for me. I think uh, for you, you can... but not to the. Oh, now it's good. Okay, now it's good. Very yeah, I think good. you just have to speak closer to the the, the mic. To the mic. Itself. Okay, how is that? Is that good, everybody? Perfect. Great. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the chat. Next next page, please. I know Mark know Mark Oh, Next. Next. <laughs> E palina me no apta ue, a mama, ua no, ua le le vale a pinu ue. So there's two parts to this talk. I want to talk about the ancestor that I most resonate with, the Haumea. But I want to also explain how Haumea and the four elements come together. Next. So the four Akua or divine elements. Earth, ocean, stars, and sun. Next. When Earth lives in ocean, the moon is born. Next. When Earth lives with stars or Hawaiian, Hawaiian islands and Hawaiian people are born. Next. When Earth lives with sun, a volcano plant is born. Next. The four divine elements are called Earth is Haumea, Ocean is Kanaloa, Stars are Wakea, also known as Orion, and the Sun is Kani. Next. When Earth Mother or Haumea lives with Ocean Kanaloa, the Moon Kina is born. Next. When Earth Mother Haumea lives with Sky Father, the Stars Wakea Orion, Hawaiian islands and Hawaiian people are born. Next. 
when Earth Mother Halmea lives with the son Kani, the volcano clan Pele, is born. All Akua come from these four Akua. Reminds me to Next. In the 1700s, ancestors said in the Meleakapui that the beginning of Hawaiian time was when? Next. <clears throat> Haumea, also known as Pohanaumoku, Earth Mother, slept with With so she slept with Wakia Sky Father Orion. Now, what does this story mean? What's the Kona of this story? Next. On Oahu, the first Zero North Temple was built by Wakea to measure the movement of the sun from winter to summer solstices and to predict weather. This was the job of a Lui, and men worshipped at the Lui King Temple. Next. On the Ahu, Haumea, Earth Mother, is the foremost female Akua. She's born on the Ahu and becomes the great divine element of the land. The female temples, Haleopapa, are built to teach female knowledge to women. Next. So in the Mo'olelo of Haumea, Haumea of the Paliku lineage is an Akua Bahine of knowledge, childbirth, politics, and war. And you can see this in this uh, photograph of Kualo and Hakipu'u. There's a red line that points to the Paliku cliffs. That's the name of the genealogy of Haumea. And that is the name uh, of the cliffs of that land, and that is where the Paliku lineage has its um, has its base. Next, now you should know that Haumea is reborn in her daughters. In fact, she's born in every reborn in every generation of Akua Vahine and Hawaiian women. So uh, here I am, Haumea, before you, and all Hawaiian women are Haumea, just like all Hawaiian men are Wakea. So, Kuakanehele tells us that Haumea is reborn in her daughters, Papa Huli Honua, Papa who searches the earth, Papa Huli Lani, Papa who searches the heavens, and Papa Nui Hanel Mofi, great Papa who gives birth to others. Next. Haumea is also a Mo'o Vahine or lizard woman who can change body form from a Mo'o to a woman sitting next to a waterfall, a pool, fish pond or the ocean, Mo'o Wahine are in charge of fresh water gushing, gushing up in springs in fish ponds. As you can see in this uh, photograph, aerial photograph, Pe'eye fish pond, that fish pond wall protects the reefs from the fresh water that comes up in that area in the ocean and coming out and killing the reef. So this is Pe'eye fish pond, 88 acres full of fresh water springs. Next. Home is also in the Lo'ikalo, the Mo'o Vahine take care of the water, control the water that are in the Lo'ikalo. So both wetland kalo fields and freshwater ponds are only found in Hawaii, where the water is guided by Mo'o Vahine. This is not done anywhere else in the region. Next. But let's leave Waki and Haumea and temples and fish farms and Lo'ikalo for a bit. Let's look at the 100 generations of ancestors and what we learn from them. <clears throat> Dr. Kualani Kanahele says that our ancestors' DNA live inside us and can teach us all of their knowledge if we just listen to them. <coughs> I'm going to tell you a story about my Mo'opuna. So for the past um, seven or eight years, um, since my granddaughter, who is now 14, started to go to an English language school, every Sunday I would have a session with her and some of her friends for two hours on Hawaiian mythology, on Haumea. We went through the whole Kumulipu, it took us a year, but you know, we got it to interesting year. And then when, about four years ago, I said to her, baby, now your mommy and daddy want me to, um, they want me to teach you about the Ali'i of the, um, oh boy, sound is diminished again. Hmm, sorry about that. 
Uh, okay, I don't know how to fix that. I don't have to Zuri, you can fix it. But if I just tell you this little story, um, oh, still no sound. Oh, Eric can hear. Some people can't hear, and some people can't hear. I'm so sorry. Can we be real loud and clear on my end? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute myself to try to give you. Okay, my... maybe that'll help. Yeah. Okay, that might help. I hope so. So my Mo'opuna, I said to her, you know, baby, your your um, your uh, parents want me to teach you about the Ali'i of the kingdom. Would you like to learn that? I always ask, would you like to learn this? Because if she doesn't want to learn, I'll teach something else. And um, she said, oh, no, Tutu, I don't want to learn about the, the Ali'i of the kingdom. I want to learn the 100 generations. Next. So I had to make a chart for her. I did an Excel spreadsheet with the 100 generations. And we're going to go through this spreadsheet that I put together. But I'd like to just introduce you, and I hope that this screen is bigger for you than it is for me. I hope you can see it better than I can. But um, this is starting in Generation 1 and goes back to about 500 BC to about 10 BC on this page. The Paliku lineages for the Earth Mother for Haumea. We're going to see her pop up in a minute. The uh, Ololo uh, lineage is for the Wakea. That's the Wakea lineage. Kumuhonua is for Kane. And Kumuuli is for Kanaloa. When we look at the all the generations that have come before us, we find that Kane in the Kumuhonua lineage is the oldest, and he appears at 500 BC. So according to our ancestors, according to our ancestral traditions, um, ah, yeah, Z, can you do that? Can you change the whole screen so that's all you see? That would be good. See if you can do that for us. Um, but in our tra ancestral traditions, we come out of Tahiti around 500 BC to Hawaii. I know anthropologists say something else, but I, I, I kind of trust my ancestors more. Next. So here's part two. What is the methodology? How do we find the 100 generations? Well, we begin with Queen Iliukalani around 1900, and we work our way back in time with 20 years for each generation. So since I teach 10 cosmogonic genealogies, I teach 10 of them. I'm only presenting four to you today. And um, in the next slide, we're going to see that the queen is about generation 118, and I am generation 120. Next. Okay. Is this still hard for you folks to see? Yazi, can you switch to presenter view? Uh-huh. Can see now? Okay, wait, wait, go back, go back to uh, one, yeah, uh-huh. Okay, now go next, I'm sorry, next. So if we look at this timeline, you can see my name is at the bottom. See, Lili Kalaka Me'ile, born in 1953 when dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> and there's a picture of my mom. I always like to call upon her to guide us, uh, to guide me in particular, Catherine Leilani Lee. We also see that she was born in 1920. But Lili Okalani was uh, ruling in 1900. She wasn't born in 1920, or born in 1900. She was ruling at that time and actually passed away in 1917. So her time is about this. And when I'm looking at these various chiefs, I'm not necessarily looking when they were born, but when they were ruling. So sometimes we see little different things. Now, I'm mainly looking at Oahu, and Lili'u was, Queen Lili'u was ruling on Oahu. But she comes out of a Hawaii Island genealogy, so I have that color-coded red. Yellow is associated with Oahu. That's our color, yellow. And since I've been on Oahu for many generations now, uh, the last four generations, I, I, I would like to say, um, you know, Oahu is my land. But my family comes from Maui. And if you can see my mother, here I am, Lili Kala. And then there's my mother, Catherine Leilani Lee. My grandmother, Nadine Haleakala Mackenzie, who was a genealogist and who I am named for. 
her mother, Nelly Ruder. And then all the way up, these are all Maui chiefs, all the way to Kuma'ilehiva. Okay. And then we have also um, purple, which is for Kauai. All right, there's Kauai, there's Kaumuali'i, and you can see he's generation um, 112. And then the blue are people who are don't come from Hawaii, they're from somewhere else. Okay, next. So we're going to go back in time and see who our ancestors are. And actually, I want to point out to you uh, the name Kuali'i on the yellow side. He was, and we can see that we're going from generation 99 to generation 109. And Kuali'i here is around uh, 1660 to 1700. Actually, he lived 100 years. Um, he united the Northern Islands. So he was Mo'i of O'ahu, as well as Moloka'i and Kawa'i and Ni'ihau. And actually, Kawa'i and Ni'ihau invited him to be Mo'i there because his grandmother was a Kavelo, one of the high chiefly lines of Kawa'i. Okay, who else do we have here? Well, we have all of these. Uh, we have Kalani Nui'a Mama, for whom is the Kumaliho. And we go back a few generations and we see Umi Ali Loa. There's Umi Ali Loa. And he lived in Waipio. And he's quite famous. In fact, Kamakau and Malo said, if you think that you do not descend from Umi, you don't know who your father is. So I guess what I want to say to you is, even though we can trace certain lines on different islands, they have intermarried so much that these are all our collective ancestors. Why? Because, because we have so many people coming down from them and they intermarry. This is just really very, very basic. This is the kindergarten level. Okay, next. Now, I want to tell you about this um, chief named Maili Kukahi. And he's very famous. He lived around 1400, generation 93. And, and he divided Oahu into 80 Ahupua'a. So he's very famous for dividing. He was the first chief to divide an island into Ahupua'a. At least that's what we hear from Kamakau. And I want to show you this map of Waikiki. It was from 1893, and you can find it for free on abakonahiki.org, which is my website. You can go there and you can download all kinds of maps for Oahu. We have one Ahupua map for each Ahupua on Oahu, and sometimes we have five or six or seven. So go in and have a look. Everything's free. Um, but I love this 1893. You know, the overthrow is happening, and look at Waikiki. Maili Kukahi was said to have lived in Waikiki. And he's famous for building all these lo'i. Can you see the lo'i kala, the wetland taro patches here? And can you see all of the fish ponds? This one, actually this one right above, which I don't have an arrow on, uh, those are the fish ponds that used to be by Pucks Alley. And the fish ponds that I'm pointing to now with the first red arrow, those were fish ponds around uh, the Old Willow's restaurant. Uh, the next one is, this next fish pond was, uh, is now underneath Ala Moana shopping center. And these fish ponds in Waikiki are where um, Fort Terusi is today. And Hilton, those are all the fish ponds that were in Waikiki before, until actually uh, the 1920s. Yep, they were, the, the ones down below were filled in the 1920s when this land got taken over by Fort Terusi. Okay, so this is what Maile Kukahi did. He made fish ponds, he made taro patches, the year is 1400 AD. He divided Oahu to 80 Ahupua'a. And this Oahu chief adopted the firstborn of every Makainana family to teach them chiefly knowledge. So he didn't mind sharing it with all of the Makainana. Why? Because all Makainana are related to some chiefly line. I've been teaching genealogy class now for 35 years. I have never met a student who's not related to an ali'i line, no Hawaiians, Makainana, can't find them. They're all related to Ali'i lines, unless they're not Hawaiian. And we have some non Hawaiians taking the class too, which is wonderful. They learn about their ancestors too. Okay, next. So here's our chart that goes from generation 87 down to generation 198. And you can see there, I have a little arrow pointing to Ma'ili Kukahi. Um, 
I want you to know that he has a descendant. Let's see, one, two, three, granddaughter, great granddaughter, Kukani Loco. And she is in generation 90, uh, 198, around 1500. She's the first Mo'i Vahine of Ahun. She's the first Mo'i Vahine recorded anywhere in the Hawaiian Islands. And after that, other islands start to follow her, especially Hawaii Island. Yeah, we're going to see that happening. Okay, that's Oahu. I want to point out what's happening on Hawaii because, you know, I teach a whole semester of this, so it would take a long while, and I have to get through to the end so you can ask questions. Um, let's see. Uh, when you look at that a map of Hawaii Island, I have an arrow pointed to Kalaunui Ohua. Yeah, Generation 98 around 1440 A.D., excuse me, 95, around 1440 A.D. And Kalonuiohu is famous because he was the first chief who tried to unite all of the Hawaiian Islands. Hawaiian chief with the biggest land base. They have 600 ahupua'a on Hawaii Island. Lots of people living there, big army. So he's able to, um, to amass the army and go from island to island. He also had a special gift. He could point his hand and the other side would lose. That's a long story. Come take the class, I'll show you about it. Or you can read Malo. It's in the Malo story, uh, Malo um, uh, Hawaiian Antiquities. Yes, um, then we go to his ancestor, Pili, who is a Hawaii Island chief that was born in Tahiti and brought to Hawaii Island from Pa'au, by Pa'au rather, the priest Pa'au, who also, um, brought the war god, Kuka Ilimoku, the idea of human sacrifice. And Pa'au comes from Ra'yatea. So he's bringing Pili. Now you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can he be a Hawaii island chief who was born in Ra'yatea? Because Ra'yatea used to be called Hawaii. And the name Hawaii comes to our big island, which was per previously called Lonomakua, according to Kamkau. And when Pa'au came, he changed the name to Hawaii after the old Re'yatea Hawaii name where he came from. But let's go one more slide, please. Next slide. Next. Thank you. So here we're going from generation 75 to 85. And we see that there are... Um, Oh boy, I think this is out of order. Go to the next slide, please. Oh no, no, no. Oh yes, yes. Okay, go back to this past slide. I'm sorry. We see color coded in red, Hawaii Island. And we're going to see that the ancestors of Hawaii Island chiefs actually went to Tahiti quite a long time ago. And they started to live down there. Now, you know, it only takes two weeks to sail from Honolulu, from Hawaii to Tahiti and back. Uh, no, excuse me, two weeks one way, two weeks back. So people were going back and forth a lot. In our stories, we're going to hear about how Moikeha, who was an Ahu chief, went down to Tahiti and came back. That's why I have my little icon here of the canoe sailing. Uh, this is a, a shot by my son, Ana'alehu. Anthony, and if you would like to have a copy of this for your wall, you can buy it at Papa Makeke. Just a little hint about what was happening. <laughs> also run by CNHA. <laughs> Thank you, CNHA. Thank you, Puhuya Lois. So in this time period, which is about, um, let's see, Maveke is about 960 AD, and Maveke is about um, 1140 AD, in this time period, people are sailing back and forth to Tahiti. Back and forth, back and forth. Okay. And we have um, also around a little bit later than this, around 1230 AD, there's going to be a split between Hawaii Island and Maui Island. They're coming from the same lineage. So that's why you see pink, then you see red and pink, because I want to show you what the split is. Before that, there were one lineage, actually coming out of Maui. Um, but... Hanala'anui means the great sacred work. Hanala'aiki means the second, uh, the lesser sacred work. 
Hana la anui as Hawaii Island chiefs, Hana la aiki will be Maui chiefs. Okay, we got Maui chiefs there. So we're gonna go back and look a little bit more about Maui. Next slide, please. Um, we're still in Maui, and I want to show you this chief Hema. Hema is very famous because around let's see, this is. Generation 61 to 60, 74, 680 to 920. I can't see this very well, actually. Um, around 960, 980. Is that right? 940, yes, 960 AD, around that time. Remember, I went back 20 years for every generation from Lili'u, so it's about, it's about that time. Hema goes south to Tahiti. And when he gets there, he doesn't come home. So we're not sure which of these chiefs are born in Maui and which are born in Tahiti or if they're going back and forth all the time until we get to the time of Pa'au and Pili. And then, you know, uh, Pa'au brings Pili. He says the Hawaiian chiefs don't have real chiefs. Pili is the real chief because he has some Tahitian ancestors. Okay. But before Hema goes south, there's another really famous voyaging clan, and these are Maui. See this picture of Maui? This is Maui slowing the sun. In Ra'iatea, the Maui clan are called the priests of Kanaloa, and they're centered at Taputapuatea, which, according to many traditions, including out of Ra'iatea, is the center of Polynesian worship of Kanaloa, Wakea, Kane, and eventually Lono and Ku. Lono and Ku come a little later. But this Maui clan, there they are. So they're generation 62, uh, around 700 AD, they sail all over Polynesia, the Pacific, even to South America, taking with them the knowledge that comes from Tapu Tapu Atea, the knowledge of the moon and nights of the moon and when to plant and when to fish and farm. The knowledge of how you measure the sun, you slow the sun by measuring it because you can see where the sun is rising every day, especially at the Zero North Temple, which I'll talk about a little bit later. <laughs> but if you can watch the sun rising every day across the edge of that Zero North Temple, whether it's facing east, rising, or it's facing west, like Hapaya'ali'i that Dr. Kalei Nu'ihiva talks to us about a lot, that one facing west shows where the sun is setting every day. You can see where the sun sets at winter solstice, where it sets at equinox, where it sets at summer solstice. Yes. And, okay, we got a little note here. My screen says browsers. What is it? Browsers won't play audio until the user interacts with the page. To start listening to the participants click this notification. I can't click anything, folks. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was talking about the Maui chiefs. And, uh, okay, you can still hear me. Okay, good. Then, and those Maui chiefs go everywhere. And when they come to Hawaii, they come to Maui Island, and they name it Maui. The only place in all of Polynesia, in all of the Pacific, in all of the world named Maui. And why am I talking about this? I'm a little bit bias because my ancestors come from Maui. My ancestors come from Hana Maui. So we're a Maui clan. Kabe'ilehiva is a Maui clan, as a matter of fact. Okay. So all of these ancestors, they can teach us things. And these are the stories that teach us. Next, please. Next slide. Okay. Now we're getting back into early time. This is G47 to G60, around 420 AD. And we start to see how there is a division in those ancient chiefly lineages between Maui and Hawaii and Oahu. Now the knowledge of the Nana Ulu chiefs, as opposed to the Ulu chiefs, who are actually um, brothers, this knowledge is um, uh, brought to us by Fornander. And you might say, Fornander, who was he? He was a Swedish guy that came to Hawaii. Oh, 
wait a minute, why, why would he know about genealogies? Because he married a Molokai chiefess who comes from Kauai and Ahu lineages and told him about the Nana Ulu lineage. So we're getting it straight from his wife, Alana Pinau, uh, Alana Kapu Pinau. And, and it's really, really important because it's a bit different from the Ulu lineages. Okay, take the class to get all those details. But Ulu lineages are for Maui and Hawaii Island chiefs that come out of Ra'iatea or have a connection with, with Ra'iatea with the island of Hawaii, but also the island of Maui. Okay, so that's the pink. It should be pink and red, but you know, I'm, I'm Maui, so it gets to be pink more than it's red. And then out of the yellow, on the El yellow side, the Oahu chiefs, the Nana'ulus, who are ancestors of both Kauai and Oahu lineages, they come out of Tahiti. Yeah. So here's our little map of the whole of the uh, Polynesia with Ra'iate in the middle. It's called Hawaii in the middle. And then there's Hawaii Luna. And actually, throughout this area, we see lots of names like Hawaii scattered here and there. Sometimes it's Hawaii, like in Samoa and in Hawaii Iki and other places. This is a map that shows us how Ra'iatea, Taputapuatea, is the center of these ancient voyages. And this he'e, this octopus with the eight legs, east, west, north, south, and the diagonals are actually sailing directions. So when Hokulea is sailing around, they look for the wind and they can see where the wind, when you sail diagonally, it's called sailing by the manu. And these are sailing directions on how to get to where you're going. Okay, so this is pretty cool. But I'd like you to know Ulu and Nana Ulu. Nana Ulu comes out of Tahiti. Ulu is uh, something associated with, with chiefs out of Ra'iatea. Sometimes Ulu will say, Ulu is better. Sometimes Nana Ulu will say, Nana Ulu is better. They've been arguing about it ever since. What can I say? I, I, we all descend from both. Let's not argue about it anymore. Okay, next please. Okay, now we're going back further. Here we have generation 37 to generation 45, around 220 AD to 380 AD. And according to the genealogies, this is the yellow is the Paliku, the purple is the Ololo, the, um, this kind of slightly greenish is the uh, Kumuhonua, this one is the Kumuuli for Kauai, Kumuhonua also for Oahu. There are the union of Papa and Wakia. And remember when I started this, this talk, I said back in the 1700s, our Ali'i, our Kahuna, all pointed back to the story of Papa and Wakea. Papa, who's also known as Haumea, so Haumea and Wakea, they come together in 240 AD, according to our genealogies. This is the Paliku, and this is the Ololo. Okay, Paliku and Ololo. Now, in this story, um, we hear a slightly different story from what we hear on Hawaii and Ma Maui and Hawaii Island about, about Wakea. In the story of Hawaii Island, Wakea sleeps with Papa. He has a daughter named Ho'ohoku. He sleeps with her and they have a child named Haloa, who is the first taro plant and who is also the first uh, ancestor. Okay, that's one story. And he has a wife named Hina Mano Uluwa'e and a son named Waya. Okay. But on the Oahu lineage side, the Nana Ulu side, they say, no, no, no. Papa Nui Hanau Moku, who is also a daughter of Haumea, who is Haumea being reborn, who is really Haumea, it says so in the chant. She sees the Wakea. They have a child named Haloa, but the, their lineage follows Ho'ohoku Kalani, who sleeps with Nana Uluwa'e and are the parents of Waya. Two different lineages. But from Waya on down, the names are exactly the same. One side, on the Hawaiian side, we're talking about Taro and the, uh, the elevation of Taro and Haloa. On the other side, we're talking about Ho'ohoku Kalani and the female Akua, especially Hina, Haumea, Hina, eventually Pele, all the way down through the generations. Okay. Uh, and I want you to remember that Papa Haumea is associated with lo'ikalo and fish ponds, while wakea is associated with temples. 
This happens around 240 AD, a yeah, long time ago. And it's been inspiring us and feeding us ever since. We'll come back to that a little bit. Next, please. Okay, so now we're back to generation 25, going to generation 36 from about 20 BC. Yeah, here, we're at 20 BC, look. We've got Palikus, we've got Ololos, we've got Kumuhonuas, we've got uh, Kumuulis, okay? Hmm. And we find that actually the worship of Haumea and the rising of the female Akua, Vahine, with female temples that only women go to, men don't go to, only found in, Pol uh, in all of Polynesia, only found in Hawaii. I can uh, I can only find them in Hawaii, Haleopapa anyway. Were there birthing temples? Yes, but men went there too to help women give birth. So female temples, just for females and female knowledge, this starts off with Haumea around uh, 180 AD, right after the birth of Christ, basically, around generation 35. So this is an Oahu type of thing, yeah? Okay, next screen, please. All right, we're going back even further. Here we have generation 11 to generation 24. Here's the ancestors of Haumea, there's lots of them. And then here we see the beginning of the Wakea genealogies. This is um, generation 15, and I believe, uh, you can't really see that. That's about 140 BC, is that right? Yes, 140 BC. This is the Ololo lineage. So you see, we've gone past the birth of Christ now. We're looking at all of those generations before and before Christ. And we still have lots of people living here, but Wakia comes a little bit later. The Ololos come a little later. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is the first slide I showed you. This is what I did for my granddaughter. I made a whole chart. So we go down 120 generations. The chart I have for her shows where she comes in, but I don't want to share that as personal information. Um, she was the one who said she wanted to learn the 100 generations. So for the past four years, we've been going through all of these stories about the 100 generations in detail, learning the names, learning uh, what chants might be for them, learning what stories might be for them. I want to go back and show you again. Here's the Paliku. It is the genealogy for Haumea. It's that cliff at Kualoa. It is an awful genealogy. And she is the Earth Mother. So what is inside the Earth? What is the lifeblood of the Earth? It's fresh water. She is that Mo'ovahine. She's taking care of that water inside the Earth. And we have Wakia Sky Father. Okay. But there he is, the constellation Orion. And we'll come to that in a minute too. I want to show you something a little bit more about that. Let's see, do I have it? I think it's coming up next. But I, once you look at the big screen of this, this map, a star map, the first star in the belt of Orion, which is called Ha'e Ha'e in Hawaiian, Mintaka in Greek, I think, is where the sun rises at equinox. This constellation, Orion, rises on zero degrees on uh, equator, zero, yeah? It rises at zero, it sets at zero, it's the marker, the belt of Orion is the marker for the celestial equator and the earthly equator. So when we sail from Tahiti North, when we when we see Orion right overhead and we see that, that belt, we know we're going from, it's, it's setting right overhead of us, we know we're sailing from Southern Hemisphere to Northern Hemisphere, and when we go back, same thing, same thing, okay. But before Orion and the knowledge of Orion and the stories about Orion come to Hawaii with the Ololo, we have the sun. And we have understanding how to navigate by the sun. And this is Kane. Now I gotta tell you, the sun is Kala. My name is Lili Kala. I'm named for my grandmother, Halea Kala. We are La people. We are sun people. We are the Pele clan. When my mother and I was raising us, she never took us to church. She said, I am Pele. We are Pele. And so we learned things about Pele. 
we didn't learn about anything else. And that was my knowledge growing up. So my grandmother who passed away the same year I was born, a name for her, she teaches me about the sun and the elements and the aqua. She teaches me about genealogy. Who else cares about genealogy? Lots of people do now. But when I first started 35 years ago teaching this as a subject in the university, um, people thought that was a really strange thing to teach. And now we have uh, all of our Hawaiian studies majors become the genealogists of their own family. So I'm very happy about that. Okay, we're, we're heading towards the end. I do want to leave time for questions and answers, but can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, we've got 100 generations of Hawaiian ancestors leading us into the future. This actually is an old slide. I should have put the slide of Mauna Kea instead, which is Mauna Kea is the issue today. But what do we learn from those ancestors and what do I want you to take away from these stories? What am I most interested in today and what am I teaching about? Next slide, please. I wanna to talk to you about the Haumea and the fish ponds. Here's a map. Of Kailua fish ponds, where Hauvahine, another name for Haumea, was the mo'o. In fact, she's still the mo'o there. This fish pond, which is inland, you can see the shoreline is over here. You know there's a lot of land in between this fish pond and the ocean. It's an inland fish pond, totally fresh water. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, take some fresh water. Mm-hmm. This Kavainui fish pond, the Great Water, 450 acres. And since we could make minimally 300, excuse me, 300 um, pounds of fish per acre, when you combine Kavainui with Kaelipulu, excuse me, which was a 280 acre fish pond, we had 730 acres of fish pond just in Kailua making 219,000 pounds of fish a year. Now, the water is still coming up there. And there are all kinds of wonderful people working on Kavainui fish pond to rejuvenate it, to make sure it uh, can grow uh, fish again. The problem is mm, around uh, 1920 or so, there was a canal built to drain Kavainui uh, swamp, as they were calling it. This is, a, this is a map from 1913. They, they put in a canal to drain it, let all the water out. So if we were just to close up that canal, we could have a fish pond again. We could have a fish pond again. Ka'elipulu, no, because the underground water that comes from the mountain, uh, Konahuanui, all this water comes down underground and pops up in different areas. Kavainui is one place, Ka'elipulu, some of the springs that, or the, the lava tubes that would have brought springs into this area have been damaged by roads, uh, building roads nearby. And so we don't have fresh water coming up too much in Ka'elipulu. But we do in Kavainui. And notice how Kavainui and Ka'elipulu are connected by a Y that eventually went into the ocean. You folks know this. This is Kailua Beach. This is where the canal comes in. And they were away. Isn't that cool? But that's not all. Next slide, please. We can go around the corner to Mauna Lua, today called Hawaii Kai. It was part of Ko'olau Poco. In fact, it was part of Waimanalo. And there was a fish pond called Kuapa, 523 acre fish pond. The road used to go right by it. There were only three openings to the ocean. This whole 523 acre fish pond was, was funded by or sourced by fresh water springs. And you know, fish love to spawn in fresh water. So all the fish ponds that we had around the island, fish would come there to spawn, just like the salmon leap up from the ocean into streams where they were born. Same thing. The fish would come in to spawn and then they would stay because lots of limu grew in the freshwater ponds and they could eat as much as they wanted. Wasn't that fun? Right. So this Kuapa fish pond was 523 acres, the largest fish pond in all of the Hawaiian Islands. In fact, the largest fish pond in the Pacific. And I just recently found out it's the largest fish pond in the world. There's our ancestor Haumea. 
this fish pond is connected underground to to uh, Kavainui and to Kaelipulu. And the Kupuna knew that, and they used to watch the fish swim <clears throat> underground from one place to the next. They knew the underground aquifers. Most of them are connected. We have to be careful about that. Okay, next. I'd like you to know that on Oahu's latest 1880, there were 114 freshwater fish ponds. Uh, Oahu had the most of all, more than all. Of them, than all. Um, that was 3,600 acres producing 300 pounds of fish per acre per year. That's 1 million pounds of fish annually, only from the land, don't even have to go out to the reef. And more fish ponds and pond acreage than all the other Hawaiian islands combined. This is the largest freshwater fish ponds in the world. This is the Haumea. This is the Mo'ovaine. Next. And of course, the fresh water flows into hundreds of acres of wetland taro that feeds 10 to 15 more people per acre than dry land kalo. This is the Vaya Haumea. This is the water. Now, sometimes it comes from rivers. And sometimes it comes from underground springs. In fact, if you look at the map of Waikiki in 1893, a lot of those were not connected to a river. They came from underground springs, hence the name Waikiki, sprouting water. Hi, that's kind of fun. Okay, next. So this brings me to the end of my talk and I'm gonna open up for questions because I like to have people ask questions and we can go back through if you like. Well, maybe not, maybe that's too hard, but we can talk about what you've seen so far. I want you to know that um, a lot of times we as Hawaiians have a problem connecting with our ancestors, all the ancestors I've just showed you. So, you know, you can come and take my class, Hawaiian Studies 341, but more than that, you can also do your own research. You don't have to come to university. And so I'm announcing a new website that I just got funded by Kabemna Schools. I've hired nine brilliant young Native Hawaiians, graduate students, undergraduate students, they're really, really smart. They're setting up a website and we're gonna be looking at 9,000 pages of handwritten genealogy from the Hawaii State Archives. And we're recovering these pages. They're handwritten, we're typing them and we're gonna be posting them. <clears throat> so just for today, just because you came to listen to my lecture, my, my web team, uh, put together a new website called HawaiianAncestry.org. We thought about using a Hawaiian name. When you go there, you'll see the Hawaiian name. We wanted to have something for all the Hawaiians, especially our cousins who live away on the continent, who don't know any Hawaiian words. So where everybody knows Ancestry.org, we're doing HawaiianAncestry.org. Just a little change. In fact, I think it's Ancestry.com, isn't it? And so we're doing HawaiianAncestry.org. And when you go there, you, I invite you to go and have a look at it today. You will see that we have started to post book one. There are 54 books of handwritten stuff. The handwritten is being posted. We haven't finished transcribing yet. We just got hired. Just got, I think last month we got the last person hired. But 9,000 pages. Now, I started to go through this with my one of my uh, grad students, Alyssa Purcell, who was working for me as an intern at the archives. And she had been there working for a year on the Lili Uokalani papers. When it came to be about May, I said, oh, you know, your grant is going to end soon. So can you go Xerox the genealogy books for me so I can have a look at them? Because I can't get down there in this pandemic and all of that. And when she went to talk to Director Jensen about it, he said, oh, they've already been scanned by the Mormons. And for, you know, and you can have a look at it. But when we looked at it, it was all handwritten. So she started to type it up and we'd go through them together. And I'm gonna tell you in about the first 100 pages of all the genealogy that's there, I had not seen fully one third of those genealogies published anywhere, generally following on the female lines. I was so excited. I've been researching genealogy for 40 years, 40 years. So I thought, okay, now we have Zoom and we have the web and you know, I'm a kupuna. So I told all my students, make it easy because I can't find my way around a lot of websites. So please help us out. They're gonna make it easy enough for me to find. It'll be easy enough for you to find, I promise. Once 
the English, uh, the typewritten, excuse me, that typewritten, it's not in English, the typewritten uh, genealogies go up. You can, they'll be searchable. You can plug in a name and you can find it. And we're going to have 54 books up eventually. But right now, we're still working on the first uh, 500 pages. <laughs> we will have 9,000 pages typed pretty soon. So if you are uh, interested in following up more on that, that's great. But I want to stop now and I want to leave time for questions. Z, uh, how do I find the questions? I can't click. Oh, do I can? Can I click on Q&A? Um, uh, yes, continue. Um, okay, so you guys can ask me questions now. But if we go back to, wait a minute, we go back to chat. <clears throat> well, you can't see the, okay, you can't see the, the thing. Okay, that's fine. Any questions though? Let's see, how do we do that? Go back to Q&A. Uh, people can also leave, um, uh, uh, I guess audio messages or, or or ask you in person. So right up at the top um, where it says recording and people can see a button that says uh, su suggest something like um, being able to um, ask a question or transfer audio. Uh, if people want to uh, click that, I can start letting people ask questions. So you can- Oh, okay, them. without without uh, writing them down. Right. Okay, that's fine. Can I also go back to chat because there's lots of stuff there. Oh, he says he wants to take my class. Email me, bbcloudhawaii.edu, we'll work it out. Any other questions? Kalani Akana says, I'm intrigued by your associating Wakia to Orion. Can you elaborate, please? Yes, in Kumulipo, we, we find um, that Wakia is associated with that constellation Orion. And um, let's see, Kumulipo is a source for that. He is... Of course, also a chief. We have his lineage coming out of the 12th Wa, the Opu'u lineage in the Kumulipo, that it comes all the way down to Wakia. But I think the counter of that is with the time of Wakia our, and, and coming together with Haumea around 240 AD is when the knowledge of the stars like Orion become used by our, our ancestors. Now, Orion is not called Wakia anywhere else in Polynesia. It's usually called Mele Mele. Uh, but in, according to Poi Poi, Orion, one of the stars in the, the shoulder of Orion, Beetlejuice, is Mele Mele. The belt, the first star in the belt is Ha'e Ha'e. And actually, Dr. Kalei Nuhiba has done a lot of work in, in researching these things, the star things, by Poi Poi, but it's all in the Hawaiian language newspaper. I think it's Kanei Puni in 1906, around there. Uh, Kalei, if you're watching, oh no, I think Kalei's talking now. But it, but but um, check back with me, we'll figure that out. But yes, Wakia is associated with Orion. And the knowledge, when you know the first star in the belt of Orion, and you can see where it's rising, yeah, say that it's rising in that doorway behind me. You can see where it's rising. Maybe it's rising over a mountain. You can see that star rises there every single night when Orion's in the sky. When the sun rises at that place, you know the sun is in the first star of the belt of Orion that's due east on the equator, zero degrees on the equator, 90 degrees east actually. And you can make a line, you can put up a pole when the sun rises there and you can see a line east-west. And then if you know, as the ancestors did, that north-south is a 90 degree angle from east west you can make a line for north south and that's how you can build a, a temple that has one wall zero north in hawaii we had many of them in tahiti Taputapuatea zero north i actually have observed the stars rising there they are connected to stars as well as to um to the sun and how we know that we're correct on a zero north temple like Hapaya'i, where setting, you will see the constellation of Orion, that first star in the belt of Orion, setting in the middle, upright on Hapaya'i. You will see um, the star Antares, also known as Lehuakona, in the constellation Scorpio, also known as Manayakalani, setting right on that upright where the sun sets at winter solstice. And in the and when you look at summer solstice, when the sun is up in that area, you're going to see the constellation Makali'i coming down right over that upright where the sun sets at summer solstice. 
ancestors knew this. So in 2014, I took students to Tahiti for 21 days. We measured 30 temples. The majority were either zero north or diagonal north. The diagonal north temples only measures where the sun is at equinox. Ancient knowledge for us, ancient knowledge throughout Polynesia, ancient knowledge in uh, South America, in Middle America, those Mayan temples, the Temple of the Sun in Mexico City, zero north. Um, the pyramids are zero north. This was ancestral knowledge everywhere. Very cool. We're, just, we're finally figuring it out. <laughs> okay. Keone says, which were the first canoes to land in Hawaii? Was an earlier migration in 400 AD from the Marquesas Islands? Well, there's a lot of argument about that. Do we come from Tahiti or do we come from the Marquesas? And we went from Hawaii to the Marquesas. People were already there. They'd come out of Tahiti to the Marquesas. But the connection that we find between Hawaii and the Marquesas is not them coming up. It's us going down. Why? If you sail north out of the Marquesas and you don't know Hawaii is there, you'll never find it. You'll go straight to Alaska. But if you sail out of Tahiti or Bora Bora coming straight north, you're going to hit the Hawaiian archipelago. And so when we're sailing north from Tahiti, according to my son, Na'alehu, and according to Nainoa, when you get past Orion in the sky and you know you've hit the, that um, equator, you start to measure where the North Star is. And if you've calibrated your hand to measure the North Star at 20 degrees north, you find the North Star, you're at the North Star, you've got it 20 degrees north, you don't see anything, take a left turn and you go to uh, Hawaii or Maui. Last time they came into Haleakala, my son was typing, uh, texting me saying, Mom, we're at Haleakala. We, we're we're going to turn at Haleakala. And I said, well, of course you are. It's Tutu calling you, of course. <laughs> but see, that ancestral knowledge, it comes down to the generations, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. What else? Uh, we're still arguing about who came where and what came first. And uh, I'd love to learn your 100 generation spreadsheet, Eric. Yes, absolutely. I will uh, email me and I'll send it to you. Any of you, you want a copy? Email me and I'll send it to you. I also was going to post a copy of how you figure out your genealogy, but I'll send that to you too if you guys email me and just put in CNHA and I'll know that you want, this is what you want and this is the thing that you want. Um, anything else in here? Audio issues, I'm so sorry. Okay. I went through rather quickly all of the things we're looking at because I wanted to make sure I had time for you folks to ask questions. So if you have other questions, um, let's see, type them in. Okay. Delia says, I'm uh, conducting research on Palena, father of Hanala Anui. I've searched various resources. Where might I find more information regarding his life in Huaka'i from Maui to ruling on Oahu? Great. We now have 1 million pages of Hawaiian language newspapers online. Maybe I've read 300. I'm still a child wandering through the universe. So, I would put Palena into Ulukau and see what pops. It might be that uh, it's not there yet, but in the 9,000 pages of the handwritten genealogy books in the archives that we're working on right now, there are chants and stories. So after we get those 9,000 pages done, we might find Palena in there with a story. We don't know. Here's something else I asked. Uh, the director of the archives, where do these books come from, these 54 books? And Dr. Adam Jensen said, the 54 books come from Kuhio. He had over 100 handwritten books, genealogy books, 100. And so he gave half of them to the archives and half of them to Bishop Museum, which means there might be another 9,000 pages in Bishop Museum. And then there's back in the archives, all the records of the Halinawa, also full of genealogies and stories and mele. So our program is going to go on for a while. We hope Kamehameha would like to uh, fund us. But I tell you what, I've got nine really, really smart Native Hawaiian students who are working on this. They're smarter than I am. They're going to be the genealogists of the next generation. And um, 
We're going to have all of their names up on the website pretty soon as soon as they put it up. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's coming along. What else? We have questions on, um, sorry, Delia, I couldn't give you all of the answers, but um, Eric wants to look for information on his father's side. I'd love to help you. Keith says, well, no, sorry. Um, is there a, uh, Puanani says, is there a connection of Ka'ulu La'au to Ulu in generations? Yes. Yeah, because they're intermarried. The Ulus and the Nana Ulus intermarried. Uh, Ka'ulu La'au is a, comes out of a Moloka'i lineage. So he's part of the, he's part of the uh, Nana Ulu, but he is from his mother's side and from his father's side, he comes from the Ulu. So, you know, he's part of Maui and Hawaii too. You see how those intermarriages, and that's kind of something I cover in the, in the class. Um, then we have burials on Kauai, like Vaulena. Oh. Oh, how do we know about those burials? Oh, I'd like to hear more about that. Rosin, please send me an email. I don't know enough about Kauai. Um, yes, in Hawaiian Genealogies Volume 1 by E. Mackenzie, there's, there's Palena, but there's not a lot of information, more information. So Kamakao's written about Palena, I think. I don't think Mano did, but Kamakao certainly did. Um, and yet there's also Poi Poi. And there's all these other people who wrote in the 1800s in the Hawaiian language newspaper. It's really amazing. We're so lucky. It's large. It's the largest uh, indigenous archive of newspapers anywhere in the world, larger than what they have in Aotearoa. We're so lucky. So folks, start doing that research. Um, let's see. Keoni says, can you share any additional short mana'o on Pili? Can he be considered the major original ancestor of Hawaiian? Okay. Um, the chiefs who worship in the Pa'au manner, who worship Ku, Ka'ilimoku, Ku Nui Akea, who have human sacrifice, those chiefs of Hawaii Island that come from Ra'iatea, the custom of Kansar Ra'iatea, don't believe me. Go read, um, besides reading Kamakao, you can also read Te Wira Henry's book, Ancient Tahiti. I read it first in 1995 when I first went to Ra'iatea with Nainoa, with the canoe. I wasn't on the canoe, I flew in and got on a canoe. But I wanted to know about Tapu Tapu Atea. And the ceremonies in Tapu Tapu Atea are almost identical to the ceremonies in Hawaii Island. It blew my mind. So please go check it out. Okay, um, so Pili, he is from Hema. He is an Ulu chief. He seems to have born, been born in Tahiti, and Pa'au, the Kahuna, brings him back. Now, you know, Pa'au also has many lineages. Uh, Papa Bray was a Pa'au descendant. His name, Ka'onohiokala, those, all those Ka'onohiokalas are Pa'au descendants. And they have certain kinds of knowledges, not only about human sacrifice, but also about political power, about um, how you build temples for political power, and different kinds of worship. Okay, I don't really like human sacrifice. I'm going to leave that on the side. I'm just going to look at that. Um, but Pili certainly is the ancestor that Hawaii Island chiefs go back to always. So he becomes really famous. Now, you know how it is when you got a family. My great grandmother had 18 children, um, most of them had descendants. And so, who's going to be the most famous one? The most famous one was Tandy McKenzie, he was an opera singer. And he uh, he didn't have children. So all of us, the rest of us, go, oh, Uncle Tandy, Uncle Tandy, you quote him a lot. Same thing. Pili becomes very famous. Pili Kaiea is his full name. Pili, who is connected to the ruling lineage of sovereignty. And the um, uh, all the chiefs who come down want to find their way back to Pili because he is a source of mana, which was easy to do, you know, because lots of people had lots of different uh genealogies my great grandmother had 18 children by five different males two of whom she was married to so you know we got a lot of genealogy there okay next my nephew wants to get a tattoo but needs to go up 10 lines uh that's how many that's a hard one um i can get him started on looking for the genealogy if you do not have it already and I can talk to him about it. So again, lilikala at hawaii.edu. Okay. 
Uh, here's the link to the maps. Yes. Uh, I'm going to hit you. Lots of maps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kiave Parker says, uh, a lot of genealogical records list Kupuna as either Kane or Wahine. Are those records that don't ancestors as Mahu? Yes, they do. Because um, well, Mahu uh, refers to people who are lovers of the same sex and who like to make love male, male, or female, female. Almost always they had a, 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 a lover of the opposite sex with whom they would have children. So we see that a lot, menage à toi, as they call it in French, where you have three. You have two men with one woman, two women with one man. Uh, oftentimes the two men were lovers as to each other as well as to the woman. This is called Aikane, yeah, and Punalua. Um, and so Aikane kind of refers to bisexuality. And so in the old way of thinking, if making love makes you feel good, why would you limit it? Male, 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 female, 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 male. Sometimes you like one person better, happens to be the same sex as you, cool. Or you like someone else better, cool. But you gotta know also, there was a lot of moi aku moi mai in changing of uh, sexual partners. That's how come we have so much intertwining in genealogies. Okay. Um, bop, 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 bop. Mihano Kala says, just as a reminder, once the session is over, click stage on the left hand side and click main stage so you can go back to what's going on. And I think we're three minutes to the end of time and we're ending. And I really enjoy talking to all of you. Aloha. No other questions. I see a lot of cousins here. <laughs> Aloha, Mahi, Aladi. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so whether you're a cousin or not, that you know of, you probably are cousins anyway. I think all have ancestors. So we have all those ancestors with these fabulous things to show us how to learn. Okay? Aloha.